Welcome everyone to another CO2 Mondays with Trevor. I'm your host Trevor Matthews and today I have a great guest. I actually met a few weeks ago in person, actually it's about a month ago now, down in Washington at the Atmosphere America Summit, which was a great event. If you want to learn about CO2, start following Atmosphere and their team there, 744.com. But today's guest is named Damon Reed, a friend of mine now who we had a great conversation on Friday, which I I, I really enjoyed. I was like, we should be recording this right now. It was such an awesome conversation, but we're going to have it today. Uh, Damon is the CRO or the Chief Revenue Officer for a company called Pro Refrigeration, and we're going to be diving into CO2 chillers today. Damon, welcome to the Refri uh, Refrigeration Mentor podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Trevor. Everybody, I'm excited to be here and uh, excited to share with everybody our, uh, our story. Awesome. Why don't we start off with your story? Because you got a, a big background in refrigeration in the technical side. I'd love to hear it again. Yeah, yeah. So um, I started working with refrigeration uh, in the late 90s. Um, the company that uh, Pro, Pro Refrigeration uh, was founded and started in 1990 by Jim Vandergeesen Jr. and Jim Vandergeesen Sr. Um, and uh, come in 96, when I got started, there were some, I, I had had experience working with the synthetic side of the uh, refrigerants uh, uh, that Pro Chiller manufactured and had the opportunity in 2005 to uh, go to work for Pro and moved from Idaho State to Washington State as an inside salesman and technical uh, inside sales. And then over the years, we've uh, moved up in, in, in positions and, and worked with different areas of the company to uh, now we're, I head up uh, uh, product management, uh, in particular right now, focused with the Pro Green Solutions, which is our uh, 100 horsepower transcritical CO2 chiller. Uh, but a lot of stuff on the uh, uh, technical side, I manage our tech support team and, and field service team. And uh, it, it lets me get out and about every once in a while. So it, uh, it, it keeps it interesting and fun and just learning something i literally learned probably five things new every day it seems like yeah and that is amazing and i think it's all to do with the the way you care you know you love sharing you love helping just talking with you about it your background yeah. and your support and your training and the education that you deliver to the people you work with your customers the the technicians at your company and i love that and this is how if you want to grow in any industry you start sharing knowledge. That's the big thing. That's that's, that's right. why you know what you know is because you're you learn it once, then you share it, and and that's how I grow. So just anybody who's on here listening today, throw some uh, questions in the chat for for Damon or myself because we're going to be diving in deep on CO two trailers. So let's get into it. Yeah, you guys yeah. built the first uh, CO two chiller for North America. Is that correct? Yep, yep. The, that I'm aware of, the first one uh, manufactured packaged uh, glycol chiller system uh, in the United States. Um, we commissioned our first one in August of last year. Uh, we fired that up. It's uh, so the system is a, a 100 horsepower uh, transcritical CO2 uh, with air cooled um, gas coolers, uh, and and we focus a lot on the. Um, Heat recovery side of the things, um, things to also assist, you know, with the uh, uh, not you you not using or relying on adiabatic um, pads for condensing. So uh, that first one went into Bakersfield, California area, and it was we had some nice, good, warm ambient temperatures. Uh, it was around 108 degrees F uh, at the time, and so that's what I wanted to see while I was there, and 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 it was great. Um, so from there, we've, we've uh, uh, you know, proof of concept, proof of operation in the, in the field. And then, uh, and then we've just been taking orders for systems. Our second system was just shipped up to uh, Denali Brewery in Talkeetna, Alaska. And that's where I was the last couple of weeks. We went up on site. Um, we're kind of going from one extreme to the other as far as ambient temperatures. Um, it was interesting while we were commissioning the system, it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit ambient. I mean, it, it was just plugging along, right? Mostly running subcritical. And uh, um, at the same time, we were we were monitoring and watching things in Bakersfield area. And, you know, they're dealing with a big heat wave right now. And so it was a 112, 114. I think I even recorded a, a 115 degree ambient 
on the control system. So, wow. um, yeah, it was, it, it was, and it was, it was really neat to show everybody at that job site, Hey, look at this one. And, you know, you could just see the, the differences and stuff. So it was really, really neat, really neat stuff. But we've got, we're, we're, we've got system three, four, five, and six, I believe coming, coming off of the production line and the production uh, areas in Moxville, North Carolina. Uh, that's where I'm based out of now. And uh, yeah, it's been just been cruising. I, I love it. So there must have been a huge learning curve. So if your first one was installed mm -hmm. in August, we'll say coming up to that point, there must have been so much of educating yourselves, learning from different people and getting yourself ready. And I bet and I know for sure from that first prototype to the one that you just did up in Anchorage, did you say it was? Uh, Talkeetna. Yeah, up by Denali State Park. Yeah. Okay. So there must have, I'm sure you've learned so much just within that first installation to the second installation why don't we talk about yeah, how, how yeah. that first one went to where you went this week or last week and uh, commissioned yeah. another one so yeah you you definitely the the it's been a very steep learning curve and you know you, you got to really rely on the team around you you know we we uh invested in working with an with an engineering group that had uh, you know, uh, about 16 years of experience just working with CO2 uh, systems. Um, so I was able to to work with them. I had a mechanical engineer on that with that group, controls engineer um, that we were able to uh, work with. So any of the questions that I that we would that I would have or that anybody in my organization would have um, that ties the kind of the operations to the the engineering side. You know, we were able to get those questions answered quickly and, and correctly. Um, and then we also worked with a group out of California with that first system who had hands-on experience working with CO2 uh, and the control system. Um, and that was, that was huge as well. So, you know, it's not, it, it's a, it was a team effort. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough, our CEO put together a, a heck of a team uh, to help build us up and, and now we're kind of we're, we're we're ready to rock and roll. So, uh, but there was a lot of things you learn. Some of the little things that you pick up the, that you learn along the way is you know uh, the first things you, that I can remember going through and seeing was it was almost a lot of lot of fear. Uh, you know, playing on the unknown. You know, I got high pressures. Uh, oh, geez, you know it's, it runs two three times the pressure that I run with a synthetic with four hundred four. Uh, or 507. Um, uh, you know, how do I contend with that? What happens if the power goes out? You know, what what happens if uh, uh, you know I've got this flat? The, the terminologies. You know, instead of a receiver, we're we're referring to it as our flash tank. Uh, instead of a condenser, we're referring to it as our uh, gas coolers. Um, now all of a sudden, I got flash gas bypass valve, high pressure valve. Um, things like that. So the terminologies as you transition over, if, if you get your hands wrapped around the terminology, then when you're having conversation with people uh, working with the refrigerant, it just makes things go a lot smoother. Um, and you're not having to constantly back up. A lot of the initial training sessions uh, that I can remember taking part of too were, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on enthalpy uh, charts and things like that. And, and but you always wonder like, okay, well, where does the putting the wrench on the nut come into play here? Um, and so there's different, different avenues to go there, but you really start to build your network. So you have people who have had experience that, could, that have touched it and worked with it. And, and now that we're getting to that point, it's, you start to see that it's, it is, I mean, okay. It is a little more complicated. It does take some deliberateness in your, in how you work with it. But at the end of the day, it's just another refrigeration system. Yeah. And, that, and that's exactly your, what you said, said right there. It's another refrigeration system. Because the biggest thing that I see, and just like you said it, and even the way you felt, and even the way I felt when I first was working on CO2 systems, like, oh, man, this is unknown, high pressures, yeah. all this stuff. Other people were saying before yeah. I even touched the equipment. It's just because yeah. I was listening to what other people were saying who never worked on CO2 systems before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. These people didn't work on it. They're just saying it's high pressure. Uh -huh. well, it, it, there has to be. It has to be something wrong. And we're, yeah. we're going to get yeah. into the the leak that we'll talk about later. But I think that's that right there says the whole thing about it. You know, because yeah. we might as well talk about it now. You know. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah. hey, so we were you know as we went through 
um, through the commissioning, kind of the last, one of the last step things that, that I found was it was a, uh, there was some oil that I noticed where there shouldn't have been oil. Well, you know, it was on a, it was on a blow off valve. So, or not a pressure relief valve, but a deliberate, like a, like an open closed valve. So if you isolate the system, uh, for example, on the oil separator, you want to be able to relieve that pressure. Uh, so you can continue to work on the, on the, the device while the system's in operation. And uh, we had done some work and I noticed that there was a little bit of oil. So I said, okay, there's, that's probably, I, I couldn't really tell that there was anything going on obvious that evening. And so wiped it, gave everything a wipe down. And the next morning, uh, kind of wrapping things up, uh, noticed that there was a little bit of oil accumulation again. And so dug in deeper and found a, found a leak on a, on a high pressure line. Um, it was on a, uh, it was just a braze joint that had probably when we were opening and closing the valve, we didn't back it properly. And so we got a little too much pressure on it and uh, went ahead, bled the pressure off, uh, kept a little bit of positive pressure in the line set and uh, hit it with a torch and some uh, silver solder and, or some 15% uh, silfos and wrapped it up that quick. So um, that, that's one advantage with our system we have. We're, the whole system is designed for, number one, it's designed for high standstill pressures. So my lowest pressure relief valve is 90 bar um, or just you know, a little over a thousand PSI. And uh, everything's set up with uh, battery backup controls. And I can explain that, why you do that. But you basically want your, your CO2 valves to you know, kind of regulate if, if there's a power outage or something. But it's not like... Uh, um, um, you know, if you're working on a like a two temperature rack where you've got like medium temp and low temp, uh, we did a CO2 uh, booster system rack that had, you know, 30 PS, 35, excuse me, 35 or 40 bar uh, pressure reliefs on the low temp suction group. So, you know, I'm all yeah. 90 yeah. bar, 120 bar, high yeah, pressure. That, that is awesome that, 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 it, that it can last or handle that high pressure. But the one really interesting thing when we we're having that conversation about that leak, you know, a lot of people like it's on the high side, that'll cut your fingers off. You know what I mean? With that pressure yeah. things. That's what I've heard before. Did it cut uh -huh. your fingers off? No, it's still all here. You know, yeah. you still got to work safely, everybody. That's you right. got to have your gloves on. But he had a, a leak on the high, high side, 1000 PSI. Mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he didn't get hurt. You just got to be safe about what you're doing, safety gear, safety glasses and gloves. And right. big thing, you seen a, you seen a piece of oil, then you wiped it off and then you seen it again and it struck you. There is an issue. Oh yeah. You don't walk oh, yeah. away from that stuff ever. Good. Not in any system, you know, so good on you for, for digging in deeper and finding that because I've seen it before where people will walk away. You got to take yeah. pride in your work. Don't, don't do that. You found a leak and fix it. So I just want yeah. to get to the point where we talked about earlier, where the fear was there working on CO2 at first, and then now you're working on it. You found even a leak on the high side where people will say, oh, it's, everything's wrong if you get a leak on the high side. No, you just work on it like a refrigeration piece of equipment and fix the problem. That's right. That's right. And, that, and, and that's so true that the, the, just the, uh, hey, I know what I need to do. I need to isolate. I need to evacuate, you know, um, the, one of the beauty things with CO2, you don't have to worry about the recovery, you know, so I could just vent that, that section of CO2 off, get my repair leak and, and, uh, get it evacuated and be off to the races. Awesome. And it, it was that, it was a five minute fix. Yeah. So, that is awesome. Quick. Okay. Let's get into the, the chiller itself. So you yeah. talked about that. You just started one up. What's the process in starting up a CO2 transcritical chiller? Well, if, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll share my screen for everybody. Um, and I've got a PowerPoint that just kind of steps us through the, the processes on it and kind of the kind of a, more of a high level uh, uh, kind of overview of how we took the approach to the system. Is that uh, screen coming up for you there, Trevor? Yeah, I can, I can see it perfectly. And we'll talk it through for the people that are listening to on the podcast. Yeah, sounds great. So, so what we what we're doing is is we had a uh, in Talkeetna, Alaska, very remote uh, location. Logistically, it's difficult to get things uh, on site. It's about two hours uh, north of Anchorage. Um, so this system shipped 100 horsepower. I'm going to take you through uh, 
just an overview of the chiller system and what it is. So it's a transcritical CO2 unit. We've got parallel 50 horsepower compressors. Um, so we're running those uh, uh, similar to what you would see on a, on a parallel rack uh, system. Uh, we're just one temperature, not two temperatures. Uh, inside the system, we've got our uh, evaporators, our glycol storage reservoir, onboard heat recovery. So we're generating up to 180 degree potable water supply with heat reclaim, which we could talk about that. Um, on our gas coolers, the gas coolers are up in the perforated uh, sheet metal end of the system. And we, we run EC fan motors on the, the header fans, and then we run AC fan motors on the back uh, fans. And that's so that we could use those EC fans when the ambient temperatures allow us to and just really take that, um, those pressures down. Um, we're process pumps, everything's uh, process pumps, everything's got backup pumps. So our process pump is what feeds our customer's process loop with coolant. Our circulation pump is our internal circulation pump. That's what feeds our evaporator. Uh, everything's standby and backup. So if there's a failure on a primary, it's very easy for the customer to just switch over to the backup uh, pump uh, and then get a service technician out to take a look at it. Um, Electronic glycol uh, percentage tester, that's something we're working with. Uh, we've got a panel mount uh, interface that's, we're using the Danfoss controls on that. And that's a, a 850 uh, system manager that we're using for our front end interface. Uh, and, and the whole frame's just boxed with uh, Connex corners for rigging. And um, it's just, it's a very, uh, it's a very heavily built piece of equipment. Uh, for the best way I could describe that um, for what you see there. We also include our cold chain verification integration uh, with one year free subscription. And, and towards the end of the PowerPoint, I'll show you guys those slides, but this is only about a eight slide PowerPoint. And so with the, the, the glycol, do you use a brine, do you use glycol? What do you, what do you use for your coolant medium? So the glycol that we use, or we use propylene glycol uh, and propylene glycol uh, with water mixture, depending on what the customer's operating temperature is, that's going to determine what our evaporator temperature is going to run at. So the first system that we fired up was for a, a dairy farm, which they operate at about uh, 35 degrees Fahrenheit for their set point. Um, one of the, with this facility and, and in, the, in this application, we operated it at 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a heavier glycol concentration for a colder evaporator. Um, but we also have to protect for the uh, cold ambient temperatures. That way if something happens and pumps do shut off and we have stagnant fluid that we're not gonna freeze. So in these guys' case, they're running about a 45% uh, glycol concentration. So it's, okay. it's really thick stuff. Thank you for pointing that out because this is really important when you're working on any system that has glycol there, you need to check that. What, what's the device that you, you guys used? Well, we just use a refractometer. Refractometer, that's, that's it. You, you, every, it should be a every chiller service technician's tool bag, glycol yeah. refractometer. Exactly, and <laughs> if you work on, if you're in supermarket or anything else and you work on a secondary system that has glycol, you need to get a refractometer. You can go to your local wholesale, you can buy it on Amazon, wherever it's at. And yep. you, there's little charts for that specific glycol or, or the different type where you can find your freeze point. And this one here is 45%. Awesome. Yep. And you'll look at, when you look through the scale, there's usually, you'll see an ethylene glycol and a propylene glycol scale. And you know anything that's going to have incidental contact with food is going to be propylene glycol side of the world. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So what's next? Okay. So our planning. So, so I broke down the, the commissioning steps kind of just in three phases, you know, so what did we do to plan for it? What did we do to prepare for it? And then how did we perform it? Um, so 30 days before the chiller ship, we uh, had the uh, facility owner and their mechanical contractor, they came out to the factory for um, authorized uh, training on the system. We were able to go through how to receive the equipment, how to place the equipment, uh, making the connections to the existing glycol system. So this facility is in operation. They can't just shut down and say, yeah, we're down for five days while you make this changeover. You know, we had to plan how were we going to tie into their system uh, and keep them with 100% uptime uh, and not have any downtime. And with a package system, that allows you to plan and do that. Um, we talked about electrical connections. 
uh, CO2 refrigerant requirements. Um, you know, I want high, we want high pressure Coleman grade CO2, uh, ideally with a, a siphon dip tube into the container. Uh, and then also, what are our spare parts lists look like? Um, by having them on site, uh, that's the owner of the facility that's kind of crouched down with me. We're going through the oil system uh, with the mechanical contractor in the backside. What was nice is they're very technical, uh, hands on owners. So we can have some pretty uh, technical uh, discussions about the system flow and things like that. And it was really neat, the owner, before he left, he said, hey, I just wanna go through and identify everything and make sure that I picked everything up correctly. And That's yeah, he, he hit it out of the park. Yeah. 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 Just having a customer that wants to do that and learn that, we need more technicians to wanna do that and understand that yeah. stuff. So, yeah. The, yeah, as a tech, you should be able to explain that stuff if you're gonna work on it. Yep. Yeah, no, exactly. Yep. So, so that's great to see. And you said, and you said it already, but you guys design chillers different than most. You do a full package, right? So it's not only the that's chiller correct. you get, you get the whole pump skid as well as everything, right? Yep, yep. So that's yeah. You've got your you've got your glycol storage reservoir. You've got your fluid delivery pump that's feeding your coolant into your customer's process loop. I mean, this thing, at its simplest form. When it shows up, you hook power into it, you fill the reservoir with glycol, make sure your piping's been, you know, your, your process fluid piping's uh, pressure tested, but we start turning switches on and we're, we're running. I love it. I love yeah, it. yeah. So, you know, then kind of the next thing we did was, you know, kind of the preparation stage with everybody. And, you know, that was where we wanted to confirm we had a safe arrival. Um, we wanted to confirm that the right CO2 was on site. Uh, you can see the cylinders there, calls out the siphon tube. Uh, just looking at that, I can tell, you know, we've got the high pressure uh, cylinders and I, I just love seeing how they printed the siphon tube down the side of that yeah. one. That's great. Yeah, because there's a lot of different, depending on where you're at in the world, you're going to get different uh, cylinder bottles. Some will have a white line painted down to recognize it as a, a tube. Some will have just an S maybe on it. Some will have siphon. That's the first time I've seen one that says siphon on. Some just have a tag that show it's siphon, but you need to understand the difference between a vapor CO2 cylinder and a, a liquid cylinder. And when it has siphon on it, just like the photo there, that means it has yeah. a liquid cylinder. Well, and that, and, and that's important, right? Cause we want to, we don't, we don't want to go into a system that's um, below, you know, those, those critical points and feed in liquid we don't want to we don't want to create dry ice inside the system so what i like to do is bring the whole system after we've put a vacuum on it evacuated everything's good then i like to bring the system up to 100 psi i know it doesn't have to be 100 psi i think what is it six, 67 or 73 psi but you know I, I like the round numbers just get it up to 100 psi and then and then you're safe yeah so um, depending on where you're at too like i've heard lots of people say just like you, 100 PSI, 9, 10 bar, whatever it is, get it to a point where you're above that triple point because yep. you have dry ice, so good. Well, I've had it, like, I, and, and while we're talking about, when we first did our first charging of our first system, you know, I was charging through a high pressure uh, or a transcritical manifold set. And so, you know, you're dealing with small fittings and oh. you're, you're switching bottles. And next thing I know, it just seemed like it wasn't moving. And what I'd done was I'd built up some dry ice inside my gauge set. And so, you know, I found that out, pulled the, pulled the hose and gave it a little pressure and the dry ice uh, popped out. So, um, and that's yeah. a safety right there. Like you said, that's a good mm -hmm. point for everyone is like, I had this, did the same thing. I caused dry ice in my hose. You make sure you hold on to it yeah. and, or, and, or add pressure like you did. So to get above the triple point to turn it back in the vapor, or you're yep. going to shoot out, you could shoot out a piece of dry oh, ice because there's like, Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we uh, internet connections, that's important. I think on the preparation stage before you get on site, you know, make sure that your system is going to be able to get connected properly. Um, I've, I've ran into that, you know, being more on the mechanical mindset where, you know, I'm, my, I just get, you know, uh, tunnel vision on the mechanical side. And then all of a sudden you're like, Hey, we need this internet connection or we need, I need this IP address or this port forwarded. And, you know, it's, well, there's an IT person, but we got to get in touch with them. If you plan that out on the front end in your preparations, it makes it so nice to just 
plug in and, and you're connected. So now once you're connected with your equipment, you don't necessarily have to stay on that job site. You know, you can get up and running and then you can continue to monitor, collect data, uh, be able to get some trended baselines and make adjustments if you want. Um, so that's that's a that's a big preparation stage. Uh, and and making sure you're bringing any necessary spare parts and service tools with you. Um, you know, you don't want to get caught without that a glycol refractometer and now you're playing some guessing work. Uh, it, it's a 50-50 shot if that's going to go right. It usually doesn't go right. So yeah, you want to do it right. You know, take the time. If you have to get it, you, you get it because it'll lead to issues down the road. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So just do it right. And, and the, and with the CO2 systems, I mean, you've got um, a, you know, a couple different things other than any refrigeration technician's bag. Make sure you've got um, a, a way to connect to your bottles, to your CO2 bottles. So those fittings, um, you know, you can get them from the gas suppliers, um, but it's just the, the gas suppliers, the welding gas suppliers and places where you, you would get uh, CO2. When I started telling them that I, I'm not gonna hook a regulator to the bottle because I'm using my transcritical gauges as the regulator, um, you know, it does kind of, it, it surprises them to hear that. They say, no, we just need that connection right on there, so. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we jump into, we get into the performing side, you know, and this is where it's time. Now you're on site and you're ready to start that system up. Um, make any necessary repairs after your initial inspection. Um, we did end up having to fix it. We, we shipped the system with uh, 35 PSI nitrogen charge and it showed up dry. And we got on site, started to isolate in sections of the system. And we found some threaded connections right off the bat that needed to uh, be tightened down. There was nothing on the welding side or the brazed uh, joints. Uh, then we get it. Then you charge your system, bring your system online. Uh, and then it's monitoring and adjustments after the system started. You know, you just don't don't get done and just say, hey, it's it's running. It's on. That's what I got paid to do. You know, yeah. monitor, make sure it's working right. And uh, and that that goes a long way. So. Yeah, so everything that you said and we talked about so far, the biggest thing is the planning. The first step is planning in any job, preparing mm -hmm. and performing. But this is no different than any other system that you should work on. No. This is what you should be doing. Yep. This is right yep. now what you should be doing. And with CO2, what I'm really liking is that people are being a bit more cautious and they're taking a bit more time and they're doing the job right. Yeah, you know, you know what I, with Trevor, what I, what I find is it's, it, you're more deliberate. You know, hey, if I'm going to turn a valve or make an adjustment, I know everything that that valve's, I know exactly why. I know there's none of the, everyone's just more deliberate. And I think that's the heightened sense of, you know, what what, what we've learned with CO2 or what we're taught. So, um, yeah, you know, this is this is something that, you know, is, is pretty, pretty near to me. Um, you know, it's important that we take the time to teach our younger technicians the, the the knowledge that we've received right yeah. and the things that are put and so having uh this gentleman that's here with me his name's john uh john was with me and and you know we're we're going through things like the picture on the left we're just talking about you know this is what you're feeling when you're with your hose while your co2 is going into the system we're going into the charging point there uh you know and then once i started running compressors i've got him on the other side of the system keeping an eye on those oil side glasses, you know, at the oil regulators and, Hey, this is what we want to see. And this is why. Um, and then, you know, even taking them through the controls packages and okay, now we're, now we're tied in. Now we're going to go to the software side. You know, we're looking at the software, but we're still listening to what the system's doing. And, you know, uh, if I hear something click and then something happens, whether it be shutting a compressor off or even turning a compressor on or a, a pump shuts on or off or a fan turns on or off. When I'm in that mode right there looking at software and I hear those things, if I can't back it up with explaining why that just happened, and that's just running through your head really quickly, then, then you investigate further. If it does it and then you and then you know, then you just keep moving on, right? Um, so and and that was great. That's great with having all the people on the job site and the startup is you can get as a technician you get other feedback from other people and the questions the questions that people do ask because they're excited and they want to see the system um 
operating and performing is paying attention to those questions and not not just discounting them. Um, I, I can speak, I, I have a, I might have a bad habit sometimes of, of when it's in the heat of the moment, not really, uh, not really hearing the question that came at me the right way. Um, yeah. And then you take a step back and you're like, you know what, I really, I can't explain that. And I need to look into that a little further. So, and I love that. that. That's so important. And just, just what you said there, that's a true technician, true, true person who cares about what they're doing because all my buddies that are really good at refrigeration, they do the same thing. They listen, did a relay click, did a contactor pull. And what is it? Yeah. Why did it do it? Be yeah. curious. When you're curious, it's going to help you become a better technician out there, especially working on these pro refrigeration chillers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bet it. You bet it will help. Um, so, uh, yeah, then I, the, the, the next thing is really looking at the tools that you have available to you. Um, this is a good example. This is our uh, Pro Elliott cold chain verification. So on the right hand side, this shows a, an overview of the customer's process, right? And I look at the chiller system onto the side and I'm, you know, I, I see it, I see one temperature and, you know, I, I get so focused on just the mechanical refrigeration side. Sometimes you're not thinking about the other things that are happening in their process. So this puts it right front and center for you where all of us there, I had a good example on this one where um, mechanical refrigeration was fine. It was, everything was working beautifully. And, you know, it, it, the, the, the equipment was just sitting there saying, give me load, I, I'm ready to go to work. And, uh, but then I was able to be able to see with this that, for example, this had uh, uh, a temperature of 92.4 coming into a two-stage heat exchanger and uh, uh, it was coming out at like 60 degrees F, the product was. Well, we want product coming out at 37. So right away we knew, hey, there was a, there's something going on here with our fluid delivery system. Yeah, mechanical refrigeration's fine, but what about that process pump? What about, you know, do we got blind blockage or what have you? So we were able to jump on site and get that addressed uh, really quickly. Um, so having that, that whole overview of the customer's cold chain process is it's invaluable to have yeah. that information along with, you know, knowing, knowing what we know on the mechanical side. Yeah, and I love that about CO2 systems because there's so many pressure and temperature probes everywhere and oh, you yeah. can graft so many different things that it, it makes our job so much easier. And this is why I feel CO2 is easier to troubleshoot. Yes, there's more electronics, it's more intimidating, <laughs> but when you learn to understand the controls and the graphs, you can check what's the ambient. What should that, okay, what's the glycol should be running at? Just like you just said there, we should be getting down to 30, but we're only getting down to 60. Why? Yeah, yeah, something's wrong. Yeah, you can go in, look at it. Hey, mechanically, everything's fine. Okay, well, then that means there's something else over here going on. And I'm not saying it's super easy. I'm not saying it's super easy. This takes time, though. You got to read the manuals. You got you to take the time to learn these controllers and understand how to do this troubleshoot, but you can do it. You know, yeah. you did it. I've done yeah. it. Yeah. You know, so it just yeah. takes time. That's right. That's right. And, and getting familiar, familiarize yourself with everything. This was the, uh, um, this gives you an example uh, from a control standpoint, um, you know, our, the rack controls, uh, you know, we use the Danfoss control software. So now on the mechanical refrigeration side, you know, I can really dial in and look at, you know, I took a couple of screenshots. We make some site views, which give us a little more pictorial um, look at the system, but all the, all the data that we see, in the schematic of the system is also, you know, listed just in tabular format. Um, but this gives people a really great look. Like you can see, hey, I got one compressor running at 84 um, percent. You know, I've got discharge temperature of 152. I got a thousand psi on my discharge going into my gas cooler. High pressure valves at 33 percent. Flash gas valves at 27. I got my flash tank. She's holding at 580. My flash gas valve is probably going to open up. You know, I expect that that's going to open up a little bit to hold that down at my set point, which I know is 550. And then what are my what are my what are my expansion valves doing feeding into my brace plates? So, you know, it's all that right there just gives a really, really nice overview to say, yeah, it's looking like she's running pretty good right now. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And that's what I love about this. You can just see and it's, it's a good picture of it, too, because, you know, you got that high pressure valve that controls the gas cooler condenser. And then you yep. have that flash gas bypass valve controlling the flash gas slash receiver tank. You know what I mean? And it's a great, and 
more and more you do this, it's going to get easier. Spend some time as a technician when you're working on this just to take a look. And when you have a question, uh, be curious and ask somebody. Yeah. Just like you said, when you heard that click and that, that relay and a compressor, know why. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Well, and being able to trend the data is huge. You know, if you can, you can take and go back like, say, two weeks and look at your flash gas valve. And I, you know, so with this system being a flash gas uh, bypass system, you know, that what that flash gas valve's doing and what's happening in that flash tank, you know, it tells you so much about the health of the system. And so, you know, those are a couple, couple points that a person just really could dial into and look at and say, huh, why is my flash gas valve at 100% all the time? Why is this, you know, why isn't it not closing off? What's going on? Why is my flash tank at 600 instead of 550 uh things like that so yeah it's 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 great it's great and like you say that with all the controls uh incorporated with a co2 system you've got uh there's there's not a whole lot of guesswork going on anymore yeah and and i really like that and you know in this way it's making technicians learn a bit more because you got to dive yeah. a little bit deeper you got to understand it. This is a great Dan Foss software. I think this is the one. What's this software called? Or uh... uh, this one's the Store View. So yeah. it's the Store View software. This is this called the Site View. Uh, so this is a. These are a couple screenshots off of their latest software that's uh, web based. So it yeah. makes it real nice. Yep. Yeah, and it, it makes it well just setting up the process. But don't be afraid of computers. Like there's lots of people that said, "Oh, I don't have a computer. I don't use it too much." Well. You, you want most technicians I know now have computers or, you know, access to one where they can bring it to a site, especially on chillers like, like you guys have. So what was the next step? So, so I was just going through here. We were kind of completing the job. Uh, you know, this is the team uh, of everybody. So um, we've got the owner of the facility, uh, the two technicians from pro refrigeration, one being myself. And then uh, the contractors uh, was Arctic refrigeration out of Anchorage and Jim Vandergeesen uh, Jr., our CEO on the far right there. So it's kind of a group shot. We've got the system running and, and uh, everyone was rocking and rolling. And this was kind of our um, last shot after the job sites cleaned up. And I, I you know, that's, a, that's like a pet peeve of mine with technicians is when you're, when you're done, you know, you can see kind of with the imagery, you know, we've got wires laying everywhere and things aren't buttoned up. Hey, by the time we leave that job site, have yeah. it looking thick and span. Oh, you, yeah. I, you can tell the, difference in a technician when you go and there's a clean job site and it doesn't matter if it's the customer that makes the mess if it's around yeah. the equipment pick that stuff up move it talk to them about it if you have to do it multiple times but yeah. you know yeah. it's a game changer when you find technicians who want to keep clean work areas you know and safety right. so yeah. let's talk about some of the the challenges that you've seen so i see this is this is beautiful but so you built the first one you you launched the first one august 2021 you launched this one july 2022 what are some of the challenges that you you came across that you had to overcome with C, with the, these co2 chillers well what i found is um the the probably some of the biggest challenges were working with the making sure that people were familiar with the type of gas that you're going to work with um you know there's about seven or eight grades of co2 um, they can come in different kinds of cylinders uh, and uh, just communicating with everybody to get the right CO2 on site, um, even, uh, even into my own factory uh, on the very first ones, you know, was it was a challenge. It was a challenge that we were able to overcome pretty easy, but it's just uh, uh, the folks you're interacting with. It's not like going into the wholesale house anymore, you know, and just grabbing a, a jug of, of refrigerant. Um, you know, there's bottle deposits. That's the other thing they think, keep in mind, you know, you got deposits and rental fees on these cylinders. Uh, if you do, I think one of my first uh, CO2 containers that showed up was uh, what they call a doer. And, you know, I needed the, I needed liquid. And so that translated over to a doer. Well, the doer shows up, it, those things max out at 300 PSI. So now you, you kind of go into a scramble mode of like, okay, well, I need 800 PSI cylinders, not 300. Because what will happen is you could take that 300 pounds, you'll get your system up to 300 PSI, but then, then your CO2 is not going to move. So that's why we want those high pressure cylinders. Um, the, the fittings, the connections, uh, um, that, that really wasn't the, 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 the connections to the tanks were a little bit of a challenge, but not, not a very big one. Uh, 
getting materials to be able to have materials to work with, uh, that was just supply chain issues, you know, that you just, I mean, we're fighting supply chain issues on yeah. everything, right? So yeah, really uh, you just kind of, you, you build your network of people. Um, and you know, there's five or six different people that I've got in my Rolodex that if I need, I mean, I think there was, I even called you Trevor at one point, I needed a, uh, an oil regulator or something and, and hit you up, you know, cause I uh, knew your background and your history. Um, so you just kind of start reaching out to folks and everybody wants everyone to succeed. I, I mean, I, I have not encountered anybody that that put up resistance you know everybody wants wants you to succeed so um it's 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 just a great big team effort so yeah i love uh, that yeah yeah some of the uh other other challenges uh have been really we take the time to to we knew that we were going to need to spend time training with technicians um on job sites so um it was when when you're first firing up the systems it's difficult because you're working with dealerships who are, you know, they, they, they're trying to still run their service business, but they've also want to get in and get some training as they can. Um, and so in my role, I had to just be prepared to kind of drop everything when I could to be able to, to give training, uh, to get the technicians in the field uh, who had never worked with CO2 to get them uh, to get their comfort level uh, built up a little bit. And uh, it was, after we changed a couple of oil filters and and did some adjusting and and moving of things, even those technicians said that they said this is, I, I still want to reach out if, if I get into a jam, um, but I, I think I've got this. And so they had it. They had it under control really well. Did you have any? Uh, there's a massive learning curve to the controllers. So from your first yeah. one to your second one, especially these high pressure valves, the CCMTs from Danfoss. Uh, the manual is 160 some pages. Did you have any yeah. instances where all of a sudden your compressors were pumping down and not starting up or the valves not opening up where you had to think oh, yeah. about a little bit harder and dive in maybe into the manual to figure that stuff out? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Well, and this was a, one of the reasons why I was uh, on site um, working in Alaska was we knew that those customers were gonna have kind of a different operating profile for the temperatures they were gonna operate at. And yeah, there's 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 parameters that you need to be aware of, and things you want to change and and do what you want it to do. Um, and that was, you know, you 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 have a tendency to see something, or I do, and 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 I think you know maybe all mechanics kind of do is is we want to go right to the complicated stuff first. You know, oh this this uh, this evapor this this EEV isn't quite doing what I want. I'm gonna I'm gonna adjust the PNID on it. Or you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go adjust this. Don't do that. You 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 probably don't have to. Um, and 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 we didn't. You know there there was other changes that were made that were much more simpler. And you know it took about uh, four hours to kind of you know rack my head a little bit and say okay I'm way over complicating this uh, because you, you like you say it's it's a complicated uh, control system. But you break it down. I broke ours down uh, as I was explaining it to people. I said, you know, you really, you have your rack control, which is running your suction temperature. You've got your evaporator control that's running your evaporators control into a superheat and an outlet temperature on your evaporator. And, you know, then you've got, you've got fan controls and all this other stuff happening, but Hey, these are the two things to, to really watch. So, um, and for me personally, having, having resource, the resource available, uh, for, and, you know, as a, as a group out of South Africa that we work with, um, those guys and I, we, we, in our planning, we knew, okay, I'm going to be starting this system up at this time in these days. And we're able to bounce back and forth. Uh, it's pretty neat. You know, we use WhatsApp and screen share. We'll have a WhatsApp going on our phone. We'll have, uh, 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 we'll have a team session going so that we could share screens and take control and, and then you get to the point, you, you know, you're just watching what they're doing because you're seeing it, seeing it all and then taking mental notes and taking down hard notes so that, you know, those things can carry over into uh, technical manuals and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's awesome. And because it's so important to understand every component that you're working on in CO2. And when you're working mm -hmm. on those valves or the controllers for the compressors, you should understand 
almost every line and you don't learn it overnight but every point in that controller if it's a programmable uh, controller a parametric whatever it is you should understand what each one does oh this one starts the compressor this one starts the fans this one turns it off and and this is your yep. PID for this but you're not you're not going to know it overnight but unless you get into those manuals and start looking at them it, you know that's when you start learning you know and yep. then when you highlight something this is what I do I highlight something if I don't understand it and then I ask someone the question that's all you do yeah. Yeah, we started, we started in, in, uh, let's see, it was 2022, 2021. It was uh, right at the uh, 2020 was when we started talking about doing the CO2 project and, and doing this as an initiative. And, you know, just, I just, on my, I just started teaching myself, okay, I got to get ready for this because it's coming and, and, you know, I need to support uh, my boss. And, you know, when he looks over his shoulder, I better be standing there ready to go. And, you know, what am I going to need to do to be able to support this? And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, you take advantage of, there's a lot of free training available. Uh, some's paid, but, you, you know, take advantage of it. Uh, I think yeah, I've heard you say it, Trevor, invest in yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's big. That's big for a technician. Um, you know, that's stuff you're, you're, you, you take the time to invest in yourself and to learn. It's like, that's yours. It's, it's in here. It's never going to go away. So you own it. Yeah, awesome. So you got that uh, chiller started up and it's been running for now a week. Uh, yeah, she's running a week. It, it's been running really, really great. Um, there's a couple of things like with that particular one there, the, the facility still waiting on some more equipment to come in. That's going to actually give them load. Um, you know, if you're just looking at the system from a software standpoint, you look at it and you say, oh, geez, this, this thing doesn't have load. Um, but it doesn't right now. So we, I made some adjustments to uh, kind of by having the glycol storage reservoir and all that, I could make some offset adjustments to kind of generate some load so that I get good compressor runtime. You know, you don't want to see a lot of compressor cycling. And when you do come on, you want to, you know, you want to get your few minutes of runtime. You don't want to see it on for 30, 45 seconds and off. Um, so made, made some adjustments there. Um, and then now just, just monitoring it. And with the, with all the software, the, the way that the, uh, chiller systems connected, I was flying home from, uh, uh, from C I was on a flight from Seattle to, uh, North Carolina and able to have the system up on my computer and just, cause you know, as a technician, you've left your job site, even whether it's an hour away or 10 hours away, it just never fails. You get home and you're like, okay, now I can relax. And then the phone rings. You know, it, so it's nice to stay on top of it and save yourself any surprises. Yeah, awesome. So in that, uh, some of the photos that I seen some bits or compressors, did they have the yeah. IQ modules on it? Uh, those do not have the IQ modules on. Them. No, nope, we're not running the IQ modules on those. Uh, we've we've worked with some of those or we've talked with them about it. Um, we have on our synthetic refrigerant system kind of a different control yeah. uh, package that we tie in everything for compressor monitoring. Are you using uh, variable speed drives on, on the, the for lead compressor? I'm using it. I'm actually using it on both compressors, Trevor. Right. So, and, why, and why are you doing that? Why don't you explain? Well, this? we looked at doing maybe like a soft start on the secondary compressor. And then when we got to dig it into it, we said, you know what, let's just let's just go VFDs on both of them and mm -hmm. just keep it simple. Uh, you know, cut down on the bill of material and 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 let them rip. So your you know, your primary compressor. It, well, the other thing, you know, with the control system, it lead lags every every operating sequence. So you'll switch over to who's primary. Nice. Um, that helped by having VFDs on both of them. Uh, it helped. We can we can run the VFDs, run the VFDs on their own PID loops. We don't have we don't have to rely on the uh, PID loop from another control system. So it makes it nice. We just send it a forward run signal. Hey, take yeah. off. Go. Oh. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it makes it what it, what it does, it makes it even simpler for the technician because the, the first one is going to work similar to the second one. You know what I mean? Sure so, that's, that's part of the beauty of it. It's like it, they should work identical. Yeah, maybe not at the same time, but they should yeah. work exactly the same. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. And what about uh, so I seen you had uh, plate heat exchangers there. Um, mm -hmm. How, how have they been working with it? Because there's lots of, I guess the chiller guys know lots about this, but a lot of the other, you know, commercial refrigeration guys, some of them work on plate uh, chillers. Was there any complications working that? Because you had electronic valves now and you have 
temperature and pressure probes at the outlets. You know, I think the thing, all the things that you just mentioned is what makes it all work so well. So with the electronic expansion valves, I mean, the beauty of those is that is the range of an electronic valve is so wide. Yeah. So, you know, you could, you, you can have, you can compensate for things because of that valve uh, that, that mechanically it might not be happy for, um, you know, like for example, if you're running, you know, not the right glycol concentration, you know, a, uh, a mechanical valve might just shut down and, and kill your suction pressure. And now you're getting suction pressure alarms. You know, the, the mechanical valve will eventually do that, but it also is able to regulate better what's happening in that evaporator and, and keep you, keep you operational. Um, yeah, the pressure, pressure ports, uh, I mean, we're still just coming off of, uh, our evap, probably going into a common suction header and making sure that as we, as a manufacturer used that we're, we're typically used to, uh, building just dedicated redundant systems. So I'll have an evaporator and an expansion valve and a suction line for each circuit. So once we start dealing with a common suction group, now all of a sudden I start using terminology like my evaporator sensor. Well, my evaporator sensor might not be my suction sensor because it's on my evaporator line. So yeah. again, it's the terminologies, right? That you just work through. Yeah, no, and that, that's a great point because there are a lot of terminologies in CO2, different ones that we are not used to hearing, you know, yeah. it's critical, you know, triple point, critical point, these different things that you can listen to previous uh, episodes uh, that we talk about it, but it's important uh, going forward is to, if you're going to start working on them, or if there's a CO2 system in your fleet and you have, you're worried about it, you're stressed about it, if you're on call, ask questions, dive into it. It's, it's just right. another refrigerant, right? And it's, and I, I, it's getting easier and easier for me anyway, because I talk about it all the time and it's a daily thing. I'm into CO2 yeah. where someone may be first time they're hearing about CO2, but they may work on chillers. Do not mm -hmm. be afraid, you know, That's just great. invest the time, be curious and understand the why when you're working on it. I yeah, love be that. smart, be smart. Don't be, don't be careless, but yeah. don't be afraid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, it's, it's no different in, uh, with any synthetic refrigerant, you know, you still want to be smart, right? And it's, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You got I it. it. I love it. This is, this has been awesome. I I've learned a, a ton of stuff. You know, we, we went through, you know, different freeze points, you, you know, talked about the Coleman grade spare parts list. Like that's so important. What you said there, like, I think I've seen it before where even myself installing systems, like it wasn't as, cautious enough on that list that I should have. And then all of a sudden I'm missing a part or two and have to drive to a wholesaler, which wastes yeah. valuable time, you know, to get your yeah. customer up and running, planning, preparing, so important. That's, yep. Yep. And I love the look of it, you know, and I like that it's a full packaged unit. You know, yeah. it's not like you just get a chiller and then you got to buy a, a different a skid pack from someone else. It's, it's just a full solution. It looks like, so that, that is great. Uh, enjoy yeah. That. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to throw the questions to this live audience because I love doing this. This is a, We always have live audiences for these podcasts. And if anybody has any questions, you can throw something in the chat because this is the time to ask. This is, this, is, this is CO2 chillers, transcritical chillers. It's a good time. If you're working on, even on just on chillers, you can ask some questions. It's a good time to do it. And I want to thank you so much, Damon. Why don't you yeah. um, let people know where they can find out more about you, more about proliferation. You bet. So if you go to uh, uh, prochiller.com, um, we have that's our that's our main company website. Uh, we've got all of our products listed. Uh, Pro Green Solutions is the all the information on the uh, uh, CO2 chiller system, and you know we have a lot of other uh, good resources there. Um, we've also got a technical uh, website called mychiller.com. Uh, encourage you to check that out. We've got a lot of resources there as well. A lot of PDF downloads and some training videos and things like that. Uh, I'm going to start <clears throat> doing some uploads to that. That'll be uh, CO2 and CO2 control specific. Um, but right now, just just general overview of all the equipment um, that we have available is listed there. And um, you can reach me uh, via my email at damonr at prorefrigeration.com. And uh, happy to field any questions that anyone uh, shoots over to. Yeah, I definitely recommend reaching out to this team, 
you can see how passionate Damon is about this, helping the customer, flying the site, making sure it's up and running. And, and this makes, it's a huge difference when you have the support. That's the big thing that I notice about Pro Refrigeration. The support is there, right? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got, I've got four support technicians on staff and, and um, you know, a couple of them are even on the line uh, watching the podcast. So uh, they're all hands on and uh, ready to help people out too. Yeah, this is great. I love it. I love it. This is, this is really what it's all about learning, sharing knowledge and, uh, and taking it to the next level. If you want to be an expert in refrigeration, you got to learn, invest in yourself. Like you said earlier, spend some time learning about CO2. There's lots yeah. of knowledge on there. Uh, but, uh, okay. I got a quick question. Do you have any, do you have an idea of the efficiency penalty that uses glycol um, for your system versus a direct CO2 expansion at the end device? Ooh, good. Yeah, good question. So I don't have an exact number that I can give you on that, but I can tell you that you do. There is a penalty for anytime you're doing a secondary heat exchange. Um, you're just losing some efficiency there. So, um, but I, I don't have a number that I can yeah. um, give that to you to justify that on. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. You know, for sure. Um, CO2 in a secondary pump system, we see, I seen the numbers before, you know, versus glycol or brine CO2 is going to be a bit more efficient, but that's going to yeah. be down the road. You're going to have, you're going to have that product as well at some point, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You know, and, and you're going to, and, and there's so many factors that play into that, right. That, that are ambient conditions. And when I say ambient, you know, just whether it be ambient temperature or whether it be uh, fluid flow, uh, you know, as a customer set up to, to run propylene glycol at 20% versus 35 or 40%. Um, you know, when you do make your glycol concentration thicker, uh, it's more work on the pump. You get a little bit less heat exchange uh, on the system. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors that can come into that. So I think trying to peg one, you could probably do one number for one specific application. Um, yeah. It's hard to give a round number on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Damon, thank you so much for hanging out with me for the last hour and everyone here. And once again, reach out to Pro Refrigeration uh, and I will see you at the next CO2 Monday with Trevor. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.